Seymour Goes to Hollywood is a game with a mixed history. Developed by Big Red Software, who were enlisted by Codemasters to continue the Dizzy franchise after Fantasy World Dizzy, Seymour was originally intended to be another egg-based adventure, until the rug was pulled out from the project when it was close to completion. The Oliver Twins were unhappy with the real-world setting, and Codemasters agreed. Big Red needed to come up with a new hero, someone who could carry this game and go on to lead his own franchise, someone handsome and brave and daring and... Seymour ended up looking a bit like Dizzy's inbred cousin in the end, but with the time constraints in place, they did an okay job in creating a likeable, if goofy looking character. His animations and detail in general feel more nuanced than Dizzy did, but without the leg of previous games, would Seymour hold up? The plot of the game is relatively simple. He somehow managed to land himself a job in a movie blockbuster, hopefully not as the love interest. Unfortunately, the movie director has left the script in his locker and buggered off on holiday. It's time for Seymour, then, to explore the movie lot and solve puzzles. The similarities to Dizzy are immediately noticeable. Explore, pick up items, use items on objects to solve puzzles, meet characters and solve their dilemmas. In this day and age, the game feels reminiscent of a point-and-click adventure game with some light platforming elements. And starting off with the game, this was fun. I always really remembered liking Simo Goes to Hollywood, and I could immediately see why. Puzzles are, for the most part, logical and tied into the Hollywood theme really well. As an example, Tarzan can't speak English, so you find a book that helps you learn his language, but Simo's diction is all out of whack, so you speak to the secretary about it and she gives you some pointers, which then allows you to speak to Tarzan. All of this is learned through mildly humorous dialogue, which helps to give the game a bit more of a conversational tone when compared to the Oliver Twins' earlier work, and it really cements the game's character. Exploration is another key feature, and the game's map unfolds in well-designed ways. Starting off with a small area to get your bearings, each puzzle solved will generally unlock another segment of the map, be it a set of tree houses, clearly ported over from Dizzy I might add, a hot air balloon trip to another island, or in each of the game's movie studios which parody a famous film. It's these movie studios in particular that are the most fun to unlock, with blatant references to Sherlock Holmes, The Wizard of Oz, and Frankenstein, for example. One thing that really put a smile on my face early on was that progress seemed to move smoothly. Puzzles were either staunchly obvious or required just enough brain tickling to get that tiny dopamine hit when solved. It was only when reaching the halfway point of the game that things started to get a little bit game mechanic-y. For instance, one puzzle saw me having to return a pirate's parrot back to him. I found some birdseed, I used the birdseed, the parrot stopped flying but seemed to indicate that he wanted a cracker and that was that. I'd presumed at this point that another item was required, a net perhaps, or even, I don't know, a cracker, but no. The solution to the problem had been found, I just hadn't used it in the exact correct place. He had to leave the bird seed by the front door in order to lure the parrot outside. With trial and error, I worked this out, but it wasn't immediately obvious without experimentation. Another scene had my path blocked by a werewolf in the late stages of the game. I'd found a bouncy ball much earlier on and had a pretty good feeling that this would be the solution, but I could not, for the life of me, work out where to drop it. It turned out I had to walk into the werewolf while holding the ball, which would prompt a dialogue scene in which Seymour gives the ball to the werewolf. This is all well and good, but touching the werewolf without the ball kills Seymour, completely discouraging you from trying again. And this is where some of Seymour's worst features lie, in the archaic use of lives and energy. Like Dizzy Games from the past, it can often be difficult to determine friend from foe. In the Wizard of Oz section, for instance, I have no reason to believe that munchkins are actually evil little shits, but touching them causes such a rapid loss of life that you're practically dead on impact. In fact, energy in general is barely ever an issue, apart from the Flash Gordon inspired section which requires you to dodge remote control helicopters. Most of the time, a mistake in Seymour will equal a loss of life. Or, sometimes, just sometimes, it results in a complete game over. 
There are two points I know about in the game, because I experience them, where your progress is wiped and you start again. One involves the Flash Gordon stage, where you use the teleportation device and are promptly killed, respawned, killed, etc. This is the only way to learn that there are spikes behind the teleportation device. So in order to solve this puzzle, you have to literally throw your entire game progress away to start again, in order to solve it on the next run. I have a very low tolerance level for stupid bullshit. The second instance occurs almost at the end of the game, in the Frankenstein section. There's a switch on the wall that won't work, so you put a coin in the electricity meter and... Bullshit. The lever becomes electrified. Bullshit. This is the only exit and you can't use it. Bullshit. Each attempt results in your death. Bullshit. You have to either preemptively guess that you're going to need the rubber gloves to bypass this section, or, as before, you die, you start again, and you remember for next time. While thankfully few and far between, these instant game over scenarios are unreasonably draining. In both cases, you can lose hours worth of progress, and for what? To do it all again. The puzzles that you've already solved. See, the biggest difference between Seymour and Dizzy is that the platforming element of Dizzy has been almost entirely jettisoned. The number of deaths or energy losses when traversing the landscape are so slim that they may as well just not be there. And in the case of these incredibly harsh game over sections, they just shouldn't be there at all. Seymour is a puzzle game that wants to sort of be a bit like an action game, but it doesn't provide enough of the latter to warrant it. Another criticism. Some of the dialogue can be a little confusing. The Dick Tracy character, for instance, mentions that there's been a murder, but is he talking about the countless amount of body parts strewn across the map? Or is he talking about the Sherlock Holmes corpse? If he's talking about the Sherlock Holmes corpse, then why is he talking about a murder from a completely different film set? And why, when you do work the puzzle out, is the perpetrator of said murder in another completely different film set? Has there been an actual murder, or are these guys just method acting? I genuinely think we need to call the police. Outside of these foibles, there is one other small issue, and it's something that harkens back to Treasure Island Dizzy. The inventory system is another swap-in, swap-out affair, and it's one that lets you carry three items. One of the puzzle solutions involves you carrying no less than 12 items in order to solve it. And in order to get there, you have to work your way through a goddamn maze. The entire solution alone took me about 10 minutes of trekking backwards and forwards. With no obstacles or hazards to avoid, it just made for finicky busy work. These tedious elements only really start to drag you down when multiplied by the fact you have to effectively die twice in order to understand the solution to some later problems. All of the complaints I have, therefore, are practically threefold. Seymour has almost no replayability, but the game forces you to replay it twice at least. And that's a shame, because scrubbing away all of the complaints for a moment, there are times throughout Seymour Goes to Hollywood where I genuinely enjoy it more than Dizzy. The original Dizzy played 50% action and 50% puzzle, but the puzzle solving was far too ridiculous to really get on board with. Treasure Island Dizzy toned down the action and smoothed out some of the puzzle solving, Fantasy World Dizzy did the same again. Seymour feels like it wants to drop the action element entirely, but it won't let go of its original influence. The puzzles in Seymour are definitely its highlight, and there are some genuinely satisfying solutions to eke out. It's got a humorous heart, and the real world setting lends itself well to parody. It looks fantastic, its controls are less finicky than Dizzy's roly-poly knockabout, and its exploration elements open up in a natural and expansive way. With a little foresight, and knowing what not to do, Seymour is a great single playthrough that could have been so much greater had it not been marred by some cruelly placed game over screens. It also ends in much the same way a Dizzy game does. On finding the script, you're then told you have to recruit all of the actors yourself. To do this, you need to explore the land for Oscars, this being a replacement for Dizzy's coins, and palm these off to the residents of the land in order to get them to star in your film. I'm not entirely sure why giving them an Oscar before they've even been in the film works, but that's game logic for you. As soon as I realised that this was going to be the next task, 
I thought back to the work I put in to clear out all of the coins from Treasure Island Dizzy and Fantasy World Dizzy. Then I factored in the enormity of the game map, the slow pace of Seymour's walk, and that maze of studios you constantly have to walk through and thought, nah. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on me again. Fool me three times, bullshit.